Слово для первого доклада представляется доктору медицину, медицины, профессору отделения офтальмологии медицинского центра при университете Саарленд, главе подразделения детской офтальмологии, ортоптики, слабовидения и нейроофтальмологии, члену научного комитета Анеридия Европы, глава Анеридия Германии, совет, медицинский советник ассоциации Анеридия Германия, главному специалисту офтальмологу по проблемам слабовидения доктора Барбара Касман Кельнер. Германия. Thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations to Galina Genig uh, for bringing this meeting uh, to life. Uh, my really sincere congratulations for that. And again, um, I would like to have a little clapping for the film. No one clapped, and I think it was a good film. Thank you Thank very you. much. I will start with um, a topic uh, I pursue since some time. I, I think one ophthalmologist alone is not enough to care for all needs of the aniridia patients. And I would like to show you uh, what different difficulties patients with aniridia face and would like to conclude that there are several um, specialized ophthalmologists needed to care for the aniridia patient. I am the um, medical advisor to aniridia Germany, which is a combined group for the aniridia and VRGR patients. And these are two pictures from the uh, combined uh, German-European Aniridia meeting uh, we had two years ago. I will cover the following topics. I will talk about early diagnosis and management, about prevention, perhaps prevention or delay of later complications, I will talk about general aspects of treatment of complications. You know the high complications are the corneal disease, glaucoma and cataract. And I will talk briefly about integration into mainstream school, about low vision aids. And I would like to lead you to the conclusion that um, an, an iridia guide is needed, sort of one ophthalmologist um, preferably a pediatric ophthalmologist experienced with low vision who sort of cares as a person for the aniridia patient and then has the connections to uh, specialized surgeons uh, so that the aniridia patient always comes to see the best surgeons available for the condition because any surgery can yield complications in aniridia. This is uh, my last picture, actually. I'm just showing it to you now to make it clear to you how many uh, challenges the NVIDIA patient has to face. It's not only the medical challenges, it's the school questions as well, how to go to school, how to use low vision aids at school, which type of school you can, you can um, choose and uh, later on profession, what kind of profession you have, and you have the three big um, um, complication uh, markets with uh, cataract, glaucoma, and um, corneal opacification. At the moment, we care about, uh, uh, for about 150 patients with aniridia in Homburg, and you see divided uh, with the familiar aniridia and sporadic aniridia. And uh, I think it's just chance that in sporadic aniridia we have the same number of males and females and in the familiar aniridia we have less males. Um, if you see the subgroups of the patients, it's now 155 and the slide is from uh, half a year ago. Uh, we have uh, a few patients with BR, BRGR syndrome and some uh, patients who are not clear up to now what they really have and um, the most um, are sporadic as 
as I saw yesterday as well here in Russia, I saw yesterday I saw on the charity patient examination, I saw 33 patients with aniridia, and I think just two or three familiar aniridia patients. The rest was sporadic. Now we go on to the topics early diagnosis and management. Um, aniridia, as other um, congenital eye disease, is not too difficult to diagnose. Um, it might be more difficult in retinal disease, of course, or uh, some subtle disease, but aniridia usually falls into the eye as because the iris is lacking. But it's not always the case. Um, you can have atypical uh, pupils like seen in the lower left picture. It's just a slight decentered uh, pupil, and you can have a pupil with many little holes in it, and all these are patients with Pax6 mutations as well. So they fall into the big spectrum of aniridia. So I think aniridia is still underestimated in its frequency because usually all doctors and physicians associate aniridia with no iris. But you can really have some iris. Um, and you have to do the genetics to be sure uh, that it is pax sex correlation or not. Here, for example, uh, you see a partial aniridia. There is iris tissue left on the nasal side. And below the, the image, there is a complete iris structure with some slight abnormalities, probably not be seen on the uh, slide, but genetics showed pax six abnormalities. During a first visit, one always should mention and pursue genetics. One has to uh, do the family history, um, and you have to ask for um, eye-related disease, and you have to inform about the necessary genetic analysis and to check Pax6 and the uh, Wilms tumor region, which is, in, uh, which is involved in Barger disease. You have, of course, inf to inform about the Vagrid uh, possibility, and up to uh, until you have checked the genetics, the child has to undergo ultrasound of the kidneys every two to three months to rule out a kidney tumor arising. And there are further extra ocular manifestations which can be there. There may, may be a developmental delay. There may be several pathologies, so you have to do a thorough questioning of the family on the first visit. Of course, it is very important to have a look at the child, and often Bargel children have very uh, similar facial expressions. They are slightly hypotonic, which, leads, which often leads to a slightly open mouth. They have a bit uh, a typical uh, configuration of the lid fissure, and they have slightly anteverted nares, which means that you can see into the nose pinholes. And uh, so if you compare different Vargel children, you can see some similarities. Here again, a child with Vargas syndrome. But uh, even apart from Vargas syndrome, aniridia may come with some systemic association. For example, uh, ptosis, which is a drooping of the eyelid, or aniridia plus congenital glaucoma, or aniridia plus difficulties to keep the weight. Um, for if, um, the people tend to get a bit um, more kilogram during life. And we have to ask patients about the day-night rhythm, um, as whether this is normal or not. We have to do a careful morphological exam uh, because it is very important to diagnose atypical aniridia. And this morphological exam includes the lens. The lens in aniridia often is slightly luxated. It's sort of not centered within the eye and it may have some cataract formation some opacification of the lens. And we have, which is very important for future vision, to evaluate the state of the optic nerve head. You can have a normal optic nerve head, I will show you later images of that, but you can have a hypoplastic optic nerve, which is a very tiny optic nerve, often pale and not rosy, 
And of course, this is a very important point to detect glaucoma as well. You have to do retinoscopy, which uh, tells you which glasses the child might need. And it is important to provide the children with early glasses, with early glass fitting, to promote the visual development. Vision development takes place until uh, the sixth year of life. And up to this time, you have possibilities to help the child to learn to see. You can really be active in that. Um, after the sixth year of life, then the vision system is sort of fully developed and can't learn anymore. And you, of course, you have to provide glare protection. Um, for me, it's a very important point to um, have the measuring of the spectacle for, uh, spectacles, the diopters, and to provide glare protection. It is the earlier is the better. Um, because in the first place, the children are perhaps too glare sensitive, too sensitive to light to really open the eyes, and then they can, cannot really learn how to see well. And, uh, reflection um, correction might change during the time quite quickly, so in very small children, I measure them every half year, and from the second year of life, I measure them every year. And of course, uh, what other patients or parents call dilating the pupil uh, to measure the diopters, we have to do it as well in aniridia, although there is no pupil to dilate. The actual, the actual thing, what you do during uh, dilating of the pupil is you paralyze the lens, the crystalline lens, and to have a very accurate measurement of the diopters. And as every aniridia child has a lens, this needs to be paralyzed. So uh, perhaps you have asked your doctor, why do you need to dilate the pupil? Because she doesn't have a pupil but you need to do it for a good reflection for the diopters. Uh, you need to, to paralyze the lens temporarily. And you have always to prescribe two pairs of glasses, one for the um, inside and for cloudy weather, and one dark tinted glasses, UV blocking. Um, I usually say up 70 to 80% of light absorption. And it's very important to make sure that the glasses are well-fitting because well-fitting glasses are better accepted by children. These are baby glasses you see here, which are very well-fitted. And even in very small babies, you can, um, you can put on really small spectacles. And you can have even high diopters. Uh, in very small uh, spectacles. On the right side, for example, this child has, con has a fakia, it has had cataract operation, and in these small spectacles there are 20 diopters, which is really a lot, and still this is a good pair of glasses. The early support of visual development is important, as I said before. Vision is a learned function. And during the first and sixth year, the children can learn how to use their vision most effectively. And the brain is very sensitive to any learned information during the first two years. Therefore, it's really important to, to see the children and to treat them at, as early as possible. Some children, I saw one yesterday as well, show some signs of delayed visual maturation. This is a sign uh, which you often have in low vision, congenital low vision of any kind. I see it quite frequently in patients with albinism, uh, but it happens in aniridia as well. A delayed visual maturation means that the child does not understand how to see during the first months of life but then fixation starts, and it is necessary to help the child to realize that there is optic interest and optic signals which might be interesting for him. And if you are very worried about the child during the first months of life, uh, you know now that it is a fact that delayed visual maturation takes place in some aniridia patients, but that uh, it goes away, that it will stop at some stage, somewhere between the fourth and sixth months of life. 
The children should have what we call um, early intervention. Um, this is a kind of age-related uh, play where the children are um, encouraged to use optical signals and to, to try to find small objects on a wide background. And um, I always prescribe patching for the children to um, to improve the vision, uh, visual acuity during the first years. If there is no strabismus present, I do alternate patching of one to three hours per day according to age. In the first year, it's enough to do just one hour of patching. And therefore, there is one hour per day per eye uh, where the eye, one eye looks alone. And this may improve the vision of the eye. So this is kind of early support as well. What does low vision mean for the child? It means nystagmus, high risk of strabismus, of course, and you have a lazy eye as well, and aniridia quite often. So uh, low vision um, has other problems coming with low vision. And you have to treat these other problems as well. You have to treat the strabismus, you have to treat the lazy eye um, to make both eyes as equal as possible. And you have to test the visual acuity, of course, and this can be tested even in very small children. Uh, what I wanted to say as well, um, there was one scene in the film uh, where the film showed how the children with Anividia see. And for those of you who see well, this uh, seemed to be out of focus. But for me, it's important to, to make it clear to the parents that the children do not see out of focus. Uh, something being out of focus is, uh, you have to know how in the focus looks like, but Anivilia children do not know how in the focus looks like. They see less detailed, but they don't have the permanent feeling of uh, the vision being out of focus and should be better or anything like it. Uh, they see less detailed and they need to go closer to have a, to, to have a look at it, but they don't know, do not perceive it to be out of focus. The other point some parents do not know is that the children do not perceive the nystagmus. Their children do not see the, the world wobbling like that because the brain suppresses this movement. You see the nystagmus of the child, the eye trembling, but the child does not see its surroundings as uh, wobbling or moving because the brain suppresses it. What shall we do with in early uh, diagnosis and management? We have to inform the parents very thoroughly. We have to connect the patients uh, to a local or national support group. I think this is one of the most important facts that the patients and parents uh, come to get to know other parents and patients and that they can exchange because they can exchange things of daily life much better with other NVIDIA families than with me as a doctor. And uh, then we should support visual development and of course have the molecular genetic analysis performed. What I advise not to do is um, there's sometimes in Germany at least uh, the opinion of ophthalmologists, well, this, is kind, this, this child is visually handicapped, I can do nothing. Uh, it will go into a special school, probably will have uh, problems, lifelong problems, but this is not the way to approach any congenital low vision. There should not be any nihilism or negation of everything. Even in spite there is this congenital low vision, you can do things and you should do things. It's much better if a child finally has a visual acuity of 20% instead of 5%, for example. So, and you can reach that during the first years of life. 
Low vision does not mean that glasses do not help. Of course, the glasses will not improve the vision to 100% because there is this low vision problem. But still, glasses will help to focus the image on the retina and to make it more contrast and more clearly. Um, the strabismus does, uh, needs to be checked because even in low vision, congenital low vision with aniridia, you can have an additional strabismus and an additional lazy eye. So you need to treat this lazy eye by patching the other one so that you have two uh, eyes with the same visual acuity later. So you need to treat these additions as well. I come to the second topic of prevention, question mark, or delay of later complications. For me, it's very important to measure the eye pressure very early because it starts, uh, the glaucoma may start in a very early uh, age. There are often problems with detecting of glaucoma in children. I will show you these uh, in, the f in the next slides. And I would like to take your attention to the daily care uh, of the cornea. This might perhaps delay some complications caused by limbal stem cell insufficiency. We start with a glaucoma. This is a picture of a four-year-old aniridic young boy um, who has slight cataract on the right eye. This is why the image is slightly blurred. And uh, on the right eye, he has a good-looking optic nerve. On the left eye, however, he has no cataract, and the image is very clear, but he has a big cupping of the optic nerve, meaning that the left eye has uh, an elevated eye pressure. The eye pressure is too high. He has developed glaucoma on the left eye. So this needs to be treated. Unfortunately, this is... Uh, the nearly only aspect we can use in small children for glaucoma detection. Um, it can be very difficult in aniridia children to detect glaucoma because they have nystagmus. It is much more difficult to examine them. They may have uh, starting cataract formation. They may have cornea problems which reduce the vision into the eye as well. And they may have uh, congenital abnormalities of the optic nerve head. The, the optic nerve head may be very, very small, dysplastic or hypoplastic. It may be pale. And uh, this all makes the diagnosis of glaucoma very difficult. And unless uh, un, uh, in parents, in adult parents, we often have additional examination uh, procedures like visual field, OCT, which is an ultrasound measurement of the optic nerve, or VIP, which measures the uh, input of the optic nerve to the brain. And these are all things which you cannot do in children. So it's really important to uh, diagnose the glaucoma with the little things you have to go by. Um, the improvements uh, one could make is just to introduce a consequent uh, routine measurement of intraocular pressure from the first visit onwards on each visit, and not only then uh, when you realize that one optic nerve is looking funny and has developed a big excavation, a glaucoma excavation. You should try to measure the eye pressure at every time and to see when it's going up. Uh, we have to describe the optic nerve head very clearly. Um, some children have a small excavation uh, just naturally. It does not mean glaucoma, it's just there physiologically. But if you want to see the progress of excavation, you of course have to measure it at the first, first visit, say 30% excavation, which is normal. And then you realize on the next visit, oh, this is going up to 50%. Now there is a change. This must lead, uh, this must lead to the conclusion that there might be glaucoma. And you have to be aware that in small and hypoplastic optic nerves, you cannot see the excavation so well with um, glaucoma. One has to measure corneal thickness as well, to, because corneal thickness might make the 
uh, measured intraocular pressure a bit too high. If in doubt, if you have sort of borderline uh, measurements of intraocular pressure, you do well if you treat if you are in doubt, because glaucoma is one of the most problematic uh, aspects of aniridia, and uh, protection of the eye and protection of the optic nerve is best done by lowering the eye pressure. Um, for children, a normal eye pressure would be 12 to 15, and it would be very helpful to, to put any eye pressure to that range. Uh, if, uh, if you are in doubt and have a child with perhaps an excavation from glaucoma and an intraocular pressure of 20, this is a bit high for a child, so if in doubt, treat and give topical eye drops. Prevention and delay of corneal problems. I don't know whether we may delay corneal problems, which is one of the most important topics in aniridia. And Cheryl Gregory Robbins is, is going to talk about that and about a treatment, a start treatment for that. But um, I think because the limbal stem cells, the cells sitting at the margin of the cornea, they are insufficient and they care for the integrity of the cornea and they care for the uh, lubrication and the, uh, of the cornea and that, it, that the cornea remains clear. And my assumption is simply that if I uh, protect the eye with moisture and ointment for the night, then I might perhaps delay uh, the occurrence of corneal problems a bit because at some stage, some people develop corneal problems. Many patients uh, develop them in early adulthood. Some patients do not develop corneal problems at all, even if they are adults. It's still to be uh, seen why this is the case. And, but I advise any patient with aniridia to start early with the support of the integrity of the corneal surface. Here you see um, an, an, an iridia eye with a severe corneal scarring. And it's not a great effort to do some gel or to do some ointment uh, into the eye at night and perhaps over day, a drop of uh, artificial tears. But it might be the case that future corneal problems may be delayed. Mm -hmm. So this would be my advice to do. Here you see some patient where this treatment even uh, yielded some positive results. Uh, we saw this patient first here uh, on the left, on the right side from uh, on the picture. And there, uh, there is quite a, an intense vascularization. And all these patients have, um, the, the patient has have Pax6 mutations, and you see with the different corneas that these vascularizations are very, very different from patient to patient. This is a poor, poor boy um, I saw from the northern of Germany. Um, he had multiple cyclophoto uh, to treat his glaucoma uh, during the first years of life and he had multiple preserved topical medications to reduce his uh, glaucoma and his eye pressure. And he even was told to use contact lenses, uh, which is another um, point where aniridia eyes often develop problems with the cornea because the soft contact lens on the cornea reduces the oxygen going to the cornea as well and therefore um, this might yield another um, and more um, problems with the cornea. Um, you see his eye here in the close inspection, and he's only five years old, but he has really uh, troublesome eyes, and uh, I think by not doing the cyclophoto coagulation um, multiply and by using eye drops without conserving means and by using artificial tears and ointment, one could have perhaps prevented this outcome in the child. So what can we do with the cornea and the glaucoma? Um, we could do the continuous epithelial protection, 
We could wear, we have to wear spectacles to protect the eyes from wind, and we have to be very, very careful to use contact lenses. There are some exceptions um, when patients are uh, have open corneas, when they have always surface problems and much, much pain, then it can be advisable to have protective contact lenses for a short time, some weeks, just to get rid of the acute problems. But contact lenses should not be taken over years' time. In glaucoma, it is necessary to uh, describe the optic nerve head cupping and to always measure the intraocular pressure on each visit of the child. General aspects of a treatment of the complications. As I told you, the main complications are cataract, intraocular pressure, and the anividia keratopathy. Um, when should I do cataract surgery? And when should I start to treat intraocular pressure? In general, one has to say any surgery uh, that can be avoided in aniridia is a success. Aniridia eyes have a very delicate reaction to any surgery. Uh, they may develop the so-called aniridia fibrosis syndrome, which is a severe uh, inflammation inside the eye following a surgery which leads to scar formation within the eye and which might uh, lose the vision at all with that eye. This is one of the points why I am against artificial iris implantations as well, because it's not only surgery, it's the implantation of a pigment containing a colored foreign body and this leads, often leads to this aniridia fibrosis syndrome and therefore I strongly advise against this um, artificial iris implantation. We have of course to take care of the visual uh, sensitive phase age 0 to 6 years and we have on the other hand limit uh, the glaucoma treatment uh, to protect the cornea. So if you have a child with a full cataract um, where vision cannot develop at all, then you have to do the cataract surgery, of course. Then you have to decide what is the more important point for the child. Uh, if there is full cataract, uh, the child will not be able to learn to see. You have to extract it. And uh, one good way to see whether the cataract is as bad that it needs surgery is to do retinoscopy, which I told you earlier is the way how to measure the diopters of the eye. And if a surgeon or a physician can do a retinoscopy without problems, in spite of cataract, then the child can see enough in spite of cataract, and then you can leave the cataract inside. But cataracts grow, of course, and you have to take short uh, notice visits to see whether the cataract progresses. And as soon as the uh, doctor cannot do a retinoscopy anymore, saying the doctor cannot look into the eye, the child cannot look out of the eye, then it's time to remove the cataracts. This is a, um, a picture I put in yesterday to, uh, because I saw many patients with, uh, so, uh, which, with a cataract called polar cataract, which is a very tiny spot in the center of the lens. You see it here on the left side. Uh, this is very typical in aniridia. It is called cataract, but it is not a surgical, uh, there is no surgical need to do surgery upon that. It's quite a frequent sign, and it stays as small as, as you see it here, and there is plenty of place to look around this kind of cataract, and the child does not notice it. It's often congenitally present, and it does not grow. On the, other, on the right hand side, you see that the lens has luxated a bit upwards. Um, this is still quite fine to see, but if the lens wanders upwards more, then the astigmatism of the lens gets so strong that you have to take out the lens and put an intraocular lens in as well. This is a 14 years old girl who has a very bad and luxated cataract. You see the lens is 
completely gone, gone upwards, and there, is, there are big corneal problems as well. Of course, this is end stage, and sh this should have uh, undergone operation much earlier. Um, and in very, very difficult corneal patients, you, can, you have the option to do the Boston K-Pro, the Boston Keratoprothesis. As you know, in aniridia, any um, cornea surgery yields many, many complications. The transplant gets opacified again, and there are vessels growing into the transplant. And if one, two, or three transplants are not successful on the long run, then there is this very good option to do the Boston K Pro uh, to make the patient see again. So I summarize what to do, cataract. I have to see the age of the child and to evaluate how disturbing the cataract is for the child and for the visual development. Then in glaucoma, you have to weigh against uh, how many eye drops does the child need, how looks the cornea, how does the cornea look, and you have to evaluate what is worse for the child, surgery or continuing five or six eye drops to control the eye pressure. What you should not do is uh, do cataract in minimal cataracts, cataract surgery in minimal cataracts, because the risks are much higher than the benefits for the child. And in glaucoma, one should not do cyclophotocoagulation as a first and uh, only treatment. Integration, inclusion into school low vision aids. Of course, this is a long, lifelong topic. It's not only the entry into the school, but it's the getting through school with the low vision aids. And then it's, of course, the question, which profession uh, is the child going to take? which job is it going to work in. And if I want to advise parents, I always say, try to get a high school education, as high as possible, because the, uh, the options then are better than if you leave school at the age of 15. Uh, low vision uh, device fitting is a continuating process the tasks of the child grow and the tasks of the adult change. So every once in a while, every one, one or two years, you have to re-evaluate the low vision devices the person has and to see is there a need of some other low vision device or does he or she is able to manage everyday tasks with uh, the present low vision tasks. And you have, of course, uh, to inform the patients, at least in Germany, about the medical legal supports. As a low vision patient, uh, you have some benefits from the government in uh, Germany, and you have some um, benefits when you, for example, go to a high school or university. You have longer time to write your exams, and you, have, uh, you can have your... Uh, your sheets uh, enlarged, etc. So this, uh, the parents need um, informed, to be informed on the, this as well. As you see, there are so many topics on aniridia. Uh, this is why I personally think that there should be aniridia pilots, so to say, or aniridia guides. One, pay, one doctor, one physician, who is preferably a pediatric ophthalmologist and a low vision specialist, who cares for the patient uh, sort of lifetime long. And then if a problem arises, uh, knows where specialists are, a specialist for glaucoma surgery in, for example, pediatric or aniridia children, and a specialist for difficult cataract surgeries, a specialist for cornea surgeons. Um, it is not normal surgery uh, which is done in aniridia. It's always quite difficult and it has the big risk of aniridia fibrosis syndrome. Therefore, not every ocular surgeon can do any surgery on, on aniridia patients. But of course, the specialty surgeon, for example, the glaucoma specialist, usually does not know uh, very much about low vision devices and about uh, the help to do the integration and inclusion in school. 
um, if the NVIDIA child stays with the glaucoma specialist, then perhaps the other parts are lacking and are not uh, optimally cared for. This is why I think NVIDIA guides are necessary uh, to accompany the patient uh, during a lifetime and to provide the specialists when they, when they are needed. I thank you very much for your attention, and this is just the summary for you listed again. I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbara. Uh, one moment. If, if anyone listen, not only me, when translator said, you recommend to use iris implant, did you say that? No. I did say exactly the uh, opposite. I said not to yeah, uh, she do said the iris. Not recommend. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Vaprose? Uh, Any questions? What did you say? <laughs> so I think we should have microphone for uh, for guests. Uh, I think she was talking about Gillespie syndrome. 